so far we've done introductions uh, from folks who come in from you know around the country um, and there is a particular interest right in hearing your story around um, what really what is it like then to be able to professionalize and empower and build a profession across countries let alone across you know the pond in Europe as as a whole um, so there's there's definite definite interest in you know just hearing you jump in um, I did share your many accolades and biography um, so folks are well prepared um, is there anything you think you need from us before you jump in here um, no at this point I'm um, I'm ready to start and um, I I need your help Gideon uh, are you going to be present for the rest of the presentation I am. I am here at your service, yeah. Uh, if um, my suggestion to everybody is that instead of um, keeping this as a lecture, which is not the case, you will see, uh, we try to interact a little bit more. So I welcome your questions. Uh, the content is, again, is not uh, the academic style that the, probably the, most of you are familiar with. Um, it's more like a story. And there are lots of elements that you will see uh, you are familiar with already. Uh, so any single time you feel like you, you know you need a discussion or you have questions or comments or even suggestions, uh, please um, make a sign. I'll try to keep you all in little windows. If I don't see you, Gideon, I would really appreciate if you would just, uh, you know, in a breathing break, <laughs> you just tell me. Okay, so my name is Andrea, um, and um, before starting to share the, the ideas that I put on paper, um, I would like to thank um, uh, Oregon State University and each of you for taking the time and being together with me. Um, I was uh, asked to uh, prepare um, highly ambitious content uh, and um, I realized that in, even in building this content, I actually relied a lot, not only on my own experience, but on all the experience that I gathered in interacting with American-based and international students in counseling. So I, I cannot even take the credit for it. Um, since the beginning, I've been supported in so many ways. And even questions, I mean, not even, but questions are, seem to be the most uh, helpful in my endeavor so um, because that basically it's a, it might be a challenge and might be a reason for me to start to think a little you know uh, so I will start to share the PowerPoint and at any point um, uh, you feel like you have a question uh, please just say something I um, okay I just read the text that Gideon sent to the group um, yeah, that's, those are good questions. <laughs> uh, so let me start to share. Uh, okay, is everybody able, you can nod, I can see you all, <laughs> or yeah, most of you. Um, so this is a title of my presentation that might I'm not actually, we will see how this goes. This was the initial intention. And as I said, this being a story rather than a research-based project, um, it, it just got its own life. So we will see where we end. Um, this is the short summary. We'll talk about my personal story and about my unintentional leadership journey in this profession. Um, we will ask ourselves if we can actually really build a profession. Uh, we talk about the European context, the Romania's case, and then we'll talk a little bit about you as current and future leaders in this profession. Um, so um, to tell you in, in a short manner, um, I, I went to school to college, the old system in Europe that was five years. Um, in, including what we would call today a master's program between 1990 and 1995. And that was the first time when uh, those departments and um, colleges were reopened. I'm talking about the sociology, psychology, and science of education. 
uh, because during the, the communist regime, those disciplines were kind of banned. So for almost 20 years, there were no structured studies in those three distinct areas. Uh, immediately after the uh, revolution in Romania in 1989, those um, departments were reopened. So I was the first generation and um, not only that I was the first generation, but um, uh, you know, that came with its own challenges in terms of the um, updated information, updated skills, um, the professional shape of the instructors and you know, it was a lot, lots of fun. However, in 1995, it was the first time in my life I heard the, the word counseling. And uh, it was one of my professors who's, who actually um, learned about the reality of counseling from then the honorary president of the International Association for Counseling, uh, Dr. Hans Hoxter. So he told us, hey, there is this, um, interesting reality, you know, and that might help people and might help the students and might help the communities. And uh, we were not really able to pinpoint it in 1995. We were not able really to, to find its place because it was nowhere in those traditional disciplines that we talked about, sociology, psychology, science of education. Uh, but I, nevertheless, I liked it very much the idea of it. Then in 1995, we got the education law, the education law in Romania was rewritten. And we like to say, Romanians like to say that the, um, the professionals, the, sc the school counseling professionals um, were for the first time mentioned in the law. But even today, it's not saying counselor. The law says psychopedagogical assistants. So we identify those people, those experts with uh, what would you, you know, um, identify as school counselors. So those were happening while I was in college. Um, in 1996, uh, following up with that um, experience I had with the first discussion about counseling, I really wanted to, to research more. At that point, there is absolutely no literature in the country. There is absolutely no interest in the country to obtain literature or to talk to uh, counselor educators or counselor uh, experts outside of the country. Um, so it was a very, very interesting endeavor. And as a result, every single potential chair uh, refused me. They said, we don't know that it, what it is, you know, go back to science of education, do the old ways, do evaluation, do teaching techniques. Uh, why do you want to do that? Um, it doesn't have any substance. Uh, counseling is just another word for another word for vocational guidance or educational guidance. Why are you trying to reinvent the reality? So I was, uh, I had a um, very interesting experience in talking to professors and um, um, to institutions. I went outside of my alma mater, University of Bucharest, and asked for, for such an um, uh, opportunity. What happened, the, the same professor who mentioned to us as students in 1995, the word counseling, he was also one of the um, oldest in the community. At that time, I went to him and I said, please help me to learn more about this. And um, he um, paused and he said, well, just so you know, I have no idea what counseling is, but I'm willing to learn with you. So he accepted me um, on this um, first doctoral program with the theme in counseling, that was the research theme. Um, and because there's no counseling department, we had another discussion where to place me. Maybe is this sociology? Is this psychology? Is this education? So I had the privilege that I was not aware of at the time to choose my own department. So I chose science of education. Uh, in my head with, with very limited, very, very limited information I had about counseling, it seemed to me that counseling might play a role, an educational role, a proactive role 
rather than you know going to a psychology department where the emphasis was more on on treatment um, as a result i was asked to create this a program um, i had no professional supervision i had no books i had no articles there is no internship and there is no supervision um, i i received a lot of questions about this program you know during the years and uh, it's been a very interesting and almost close to impossible experience. Nobody else was, you know, people woke up. <laughs> the universities were, woke up and then uh, the next few attempts were refused. Um, however, that gave me, that experience meant a lot for me because gave me the, the opportunity to, I mean, obliged me to reach out, forced me to reach out for books, for um knowledge and um that's how i got in touch with um, um a series of of organizations outside of romania that helped me um next next step in what i call my my humble beginnings was that in 2003 i was able to uh obtain the um the approval from the then the Minister of Education in Romania to open the first master's program in career development in a department of education. Uh, all the master's programs in counseling that were that happened before were always in a psychology department. So they had a, a psychotherapy component. This was not only that was outside of psychology uh, department, but um, was aiming to unite experts that didn't have the traditional background, that didn't have a background in psychology, science of education, or sociology, because my intention was to somehow try to answer the huge need that was existing in the labor market, those, those generations that got laid off after the communists fell, and they were in their 40s and their 50s, and they had absolutely no skills in, in self-marketing. There was no market for self-marketing. There were no experts. There, were no, there was no real um, uh, placement reality there. So they, they were completely lost. So I was thinking, okay, so we might need experts that don't necessarily need to offer a psychotherapy type of services or we might need experts that could help those people to find a place in the society uh, so that's why i went to, to a polytechnic university and opened this master's program in their department of education and it was a great success even uh even now my my former the um the former students are most of them, they build their own business in the career development area in a country that couldn't recognize them or in any way place them uh, in any professional area, really, at that time. Uh, and the story of the Minister of Education was that I went straight to him because I was talking about a Polytechnic University of Bucharest. There was a state university, very powerful. And there were standards. I couldn't just come up with a, with a program like this without very thorough justification. Well, the, my thorough justification was in no way accepted or I believe understood by the leadership of the Polytechnic University. Just imagine engineers. Uh, and and um, I decided to go straight to the minister. Now, the minister of education happened to be a very prominent figure uh, of the uh, what you would consider to be the uh, Romanian APA, the Romanian Psychologist Association. He founded. Um, he was a founding member, and he uh, he was a really strong um, supporter of the psychology profession. So when I went and I talked to him, he was like, "Well, but counseling is a role." for psychologists and psychotherapists, right? So why are you trying to do is not legitimate. 
So we had a discussion and he somehow I was very lucky. He said, well, I, I, th I think I can see your point. And he gave me and the university 15 free slots for this master's program because he said, if you ask people to pay, they will never pay because they don't know what counseling is. So that was the state support through this enlightened minister of education who happened to be uh, a great psychologist and politician in the professional psychology. Uh, and that's how the first masters in counseling outside of the psychology um, department started to happen. Um, so that is, that is in short uh, my story, let's say from the point of view of the background, uh, the educational background and uh, in talking about um, my story as a leader, I'm still surprised when people call me that way and I learn to be courteous and say thank you. <laughs> uh, but it took a while for me to even become aware of the reality that I might be a leader. Um, and, you know, uh, there, is, there are many rules in leadership and there are thousands and thousands of books. But if you have to reduce this reality to, you know, distill it in one or two elements, first of all, it's good for you to, as a leader to be aware of what's going on. It's, it's necessary to have a plan, a goal, a strategy, and it's always helpful to have a uh, systemic type of support, you know, laws, regulations, standards. Uh, and when you don't have them, you have to build them, right? So I was not aware of any of that. Uh, and I, I uh, am aware that Oregon State University asked me to present my philosophy of leadership and, you know, all those wonderful things. Um, I think I can now retroactively think about what was my my philosophy what was my goal what was what was the the thing that really made me go ahead every single day despite of the emptiness of opportunities or or support you know elements first of all it was all unintentional i had never thought about you know, be, um, I mean, it, it's, especially in the beginning, my intention was not to build a profession or not even to make the public aware of this reality, you know, those services, wonderful services, everything. My only intention was to offer quality services to the public that I mentioned about. I, I was like, I, I didn't even think about the kids in schools. I was not that far. That was my reality. That was my personal experience with that, that uh, part of the population. So as, a, as an educator in a university, I said my only intention is to build a strong enough educational program that would offer skills to those future professionals. I had no idea what their professional title would be. But in order for them to be able to support the um, the the community the professional community so my in initial intention was towards career counseling um as i said i had no awareness that not even that in order to make this happen i had to build a lot of other things i was not aware i didn't think about that at the time everything my <laughs> When we talk about the uh, a beautiful leadership strategy and philosophy, uh, as I said, it has to be, you know, holistic and well done and well thought. I was mo mo mostly in the survivalist type of leadership because everything I done it was a very very on a very very uh, step by step uh, type of approach. Uh, every single time I got a, a problem, usually it was an administ administrative problem, I had and I solved it. And sometimes by solving little administrative problems, I became aware, oh, it's not about the university. It's not about me or the students. It's about the fact that we don't have a law in this country. It's about the fact that we don't have standards. 
or we don't have an evaluation that is somehow recognized. Uh, we don't have a uh, certification. There is no recognition. What am I supposed to tell my students? What are, what were they supposed to become? So uh, in this endeavor, I also experienced a lot of uh, isolation and loneliness. Um, you know, going back to us as human beings, I assume that all of us are uh, primarily interested in uh, a social survive survival, like we're in, in, in our personal survival. We're interested in getting uh, some money in raising our families or, or getting a family. Um, and um, after the communists fell in Romania, that was, that was pretty much what people were um, concerned with, me included. So it, in order to go to a colleague and say, hey, I need your help for this, but I will not be able to pay you. You will have no recognition. You will not be able to put this in your resume. Um, that was an interesting, interesting experience. And um, somehow I got lucky. Somehow I got colleagues and people in, in, in unexpected spheres of, of university or the society as, you know, as a whole that helped me thrive in this. So I got immense support. Uh, and interestingly enough, the most of the support that I got, let's talk about the, the two years of the initial master's program, was from my students. They were all already established professionals and they were coming from various uh, professional areas. One of them was an IT manager. Another one was a language expert. Uh, three of them were psychologists and psychotherapists. Then we had educational pe education people, engineers, because we're talking about Polytech University. Uh, and they went back to their original institutions and they asked for help and consultancy. And that's how I learned about other helping professions and I try to learn from their history. Um, I mentioned a lot of institutions that gave me support and individuals. And uh, in terms of literature, in terms of training per se, basic training and counseling, this is the list, it's not, it's, uh, it's not complete, it's just a short list of the institutions that I got, you know, support from. Um, and you can see that a lot of them are international. So, and this is in the order of my interaction with them. <laughs> so I don't know how many of you are in, in familiar International Association for Counseling. Um, then with the British Association for Counseling and Psychotherapy, interesting institutions to look for. Uh, then you probably know NCDA, uh, you know, NBCC, and I'm not sure if you're aware with IAVG, which is another international association that is um, interested in uh, educational and vocational guidance. Um, and that brought us to the question, can we really build a profession? Is it that, that easy? And can we do it from the grassroots level or we really, really need the state involvement. Uh, I, I believe that Gideon sent you a, um, some material to read uh, before. That's one article that was helpful for the students in Romania. And I assume that all of you are familiar with the elements of professionalization. Uh, this is something you learned in school, but it, this is just a reminder because that's what we're talking about. And when I discovered, this is all literature, it's, you know, 1967. And, but I discovered it very late. And when I, I discovered this, I said, oh my God, this is what I've been doing and we've been doing all along and we're not aware. So it's very interesting for me to see that, you know, I, I bet each of you had once, at least once in your lifetimes, 
uh, the realization that, oh, you just reinvented the wheel. You just discover something that it's of such value for you professionally or personally that happened to be, who knows, it was first discussed by, discussed by the philosophers in, in Greece, you know, thousands of years ago. But it's very precious to you because you've actually rediscovered it through your own uh, efforts. So it happened that the same thing happened to me and my colleagues when we <laughs> discovered this list. And, you know, we went through it, we talked about it. And it's interesting how we discovered those elements uh, in an intuitive manner. Uh, and then we saw that this is so much research and it's so much literature about it. And um, that was a very nice moment of validation for us. It was a moment when we realized maybe what we're doing is not hopeless. Maybe what we're doing, it just takes a little bit more time, but it's doable. Um, and from my experience in Romania, outside of Romania and outside of Romania, these are the elements there are, you can recognize in every established profession. So the assumption is that if you cover, you know, the most of it, then you can talk about, um, about establishing a profession that might be, that will be recognized by, by the authorities. So uh, the European context, um, I will not insist on this. I, I know you will have access to all this, but um, we, we see now the social impact of the fourth industrial revolution, and it's not very, very different than in the US or in other parts of the world. Um, our clients, and our counselor educators think that the future is uncertain. And we're talking now outside of the counseling profession, we ta we're talking about uh, the social context that actually in impacts our efforts towards professionalization in counseling and impacts the mentality of our clients and of and our own mentalities. Um, we don't know in Europe if we're together or apart. We're, we're relying on national standards and national re regulations, but at the same time, we have to abide to EU legal and um, um, laws and regulations. And that sometimes brings conflict. Uh, are we, um, the European reality is more like the US, uh, or we can still preserve our identity and our cu cultural standards. So this is, um, this type of questions actually ha has um, a serious impact in how we even approach the, the reality of counseling in those countries. Uh, when it comes to grants, yes, we're allowed to access European grants, uh, but even at the very petty level of the currency, we might not be approved because Romania, for example, doesn't work with euros. So great ideas uh, might just go to waste. And this is just one small element that I picked. There are more, more elements, you know, challenging elements. Um, then we have this immigration reality, uh, workers' mobility everywhere that causes conflicts in various countries, but also opens up to a huge opportunity for the count for counselors to help when it comes to um, the refugees when it comes to the immigrants in other countries and so on and so forth we we experience nationalism and xenophobia uh, and uh, the the unemployment is on the race uh, we also have to become real experts and really fast in um, manipulating uh, technology. More and more um, organizations, especially the, uh, in the corporate world, they're migrating towards this reality of e-work. Um, we see in cultures like mine, they're quite traditional. We see the dissolution of the family uh, and 
we see the impact that that has on our communities, the fear that um, a counselor might actually encourage a couple to split, or, you know, th this is just the one small uh, outcome of this. Um, there are changes in the social roles um, that also affects um, or comes hand in hand with the gender roles in our communities. Um, we see the shrinking of the middle class and, and endanger private sector in some countries. Now we, going back to our politics and, and talking about um, a spectrum, we're not talking in extremes, but uh, we all consider Europe as being more towards the socialistic end of the spe spectrum. It's not at the end of the spectrum, but it's, it's organized more in this way. And that can come with um, huge benefits, but also with challenges. And one challenge is that EU would like to impose one standard in various professions. Of course, there are country-specific elements, but a big standard might come from the EU, might come from a, a team of technocrats that are not aware of the, of the intimate nature of the counseling interaction. So um, what are the challenges in Europe? We lack national certifications, right? So that goes hand in hand with the quality standards of practice. They're under construction. Uh, under construction. There are very few countries that have national certifications and unlike the United States that has a national certified counselor, uh, usually countries in Europe have more specific certifications, like they have certification in school counseling or in career counseling or in family counseling. Uh, there is no consistent vision and therefore there is a lack of common strategies uh, between the um, institutions in every country they are able to help regulate the counseling profession. Um, I, I already talked about quality standards of practice. Uh, at this point, if we talk about university education, uh, academic education, every single university has what we call autonomy and has, is free to open their own standards, to impose their own standards. Um, Supervision is non-existent. It just started to happen in Romania. Romania, I think, uh, might be the, one of the first countries uh, in uh, Europe that talked about uh, clinical supervision in counseling, not in psychotherapy, not in other helping professions. Uh, and we'll talk more about the lack of clear status, um, clear roles and responsibilities that are assigned to what we call counselors. Um, we all, we're all familiar with the helping professionals in the US. They're pretty much the same in, uh, in Europe. And, you know, I listed here psychiatrists, psychotherapists, uh, social workers, counselors, coaches, you know, among the mo most popular. Psychotherapists, psychologists, uh, in Europe, PhD, the PhD is not required. Uh, this is a reality that is very uh, specific to the United States. But in Europe, you can, you can practice uh, based on other type of licenses and, and certifications. Uh, it's pretty much regulated. It's just the PhD is not a must. Uh, now, thinking about the history from, let's say, Sigmund Freud, or before, uh, psychotherapy, psychiatry and psychotherapy are running very strong in Europe, especially in the Western part of Europe. Uh, and um, being a strong profession and not being challenged by other helping professions for hundreds of years, they have um, occupied sometimes a territory that the newer helping professions are um, fighting for right now. So going back to the question that was addressed by, by chat, yes, we are 
uh, pretty much repeating the U.S. history <laughs> in, uh, you know, in trying to define the, the boundaries, professional boundaries, in trying to define a clear vision and a clear identity in the eyes of the public. Um, and Romania is not strange to that. Um, although psychology was also interrupted as a, you know, as an educational area during the communist times, they came back because they had, they came back strong because psychologists had a long history before that. So they had a reason and they had enough resources and very good people, very good experts. Uh, who were able to set up that reality again. Um, they also decided that school counseling is part of their uh, preoccupation and also any psychologist can do career counseling. So this is, this is uh, informally said. <laughs> And uh, you can get this idea from the literature that, they, that psychologists publish. So um, yes, uh, all of us, if you look at the helping professionals here, uh, psychiatrists and psychotherapists being the most, uh, let's say, recognized and stable, uh, social workers, counselors, coaches, um, uh, we're still trying to define our place. Uh, what are the major influences? We're talking about counseling now. What are the major influences in Europe? Uh, you can see immediately where a counselor educator in Europe was educated by the way he or she talks, by the way they spell the word counseling. And it's so fascinating. Uh, and sometimes by their accent. <laughs> So we have this um, British reality, very strong history, BACP, British Association for Counseling and Psychotherapy. Uh, please know that counseling and psychotherapy are considered together. And then uh, and the majority of experts, especially in the Western part of Europe, they have been trained British style. So strong emphasis on psychotherapy, um, strong emphasis of on testing, like you know, formal testing, and uh, a, a general, let's say, dismay for uh, non-formal evaluation or assessment, or uh, for anything that is not formal and structured. And so that's one influence. Another influence is is newer and it's coming from via United States and Canada. And you can see immediately now we have in Europe more and more opportunities to go abroad and study or already established professors, educators, they can go and you know, they can get a Fulbright um, scholarship, they go to conferences, they learn from their colleagues abroad and they come back with those ideas, the ideas that they embrace the most. And uh, that is interesting. At this point, if I step back and if I look at all this diversity of opinions and, and points of view in my country, Romania, it, it looks very messy and there is no common point of view. But from my perspective, this is, this is a great achievement because I personally don't know how to build quality before we build quantity. And yes, it might be a little bit uh, not structured in the beginning. There might be too many points of view and very little common standards. But I believe now watching the trends that things are going um, forward, thanks to those two uh, major influences that exist in the, in the country and on the continent. Now, what are the trends? Uh, the most, if you go to Europe, you will see that the most structured preoccupations would 
uh, be on school and career. And that's, that's based on the, I believe that the reason for that, it's simply the economical situation and political situation there. And another reason is that traditionally, the mental health part was and has been assigned to psychologists and psychiatrists. So when we talk about counselors in Europe, the public now start to identify school counseling and career counseling, maybe family counseling. Um, all, uh, so these are the biggest trends. Stigma is omnipresent there when it comes to the counseling profession. And it has um, cultural and, and political roots. The cultural root is that the concept, the, the, it's a misconception, but let's say the understanding of it in most countries in Europe, and we're talking at uh, most countries in Europe at the level of their traditional societies, the conception is that you go to um, talk to an expert in mental health, mental health, or you send your child to talk to an expert in mental health, you, might, you must be crazy or your child is not okay. And there were stories there, um, very powerful stories in my country and in Europe when children, adults, families were isolated because they just dared to go and try to get help. And we'll talk a little bit about the, so about the many reasons for that, but I want you to be aware of the stigma because it might come up in our discussion more. Um, another interesting thing in Europe, you go in Europe and you ask about counselors, many countries might not understand what you're asking for. Uh, and you will see a lot of terms uh, in associated roles with what we understand that a counselor might be. You know, they can be called advisors or mediators or human resource specialist or consultant or vocational guidance specialist. Um, we have school counselors, school advisors, psychopedagogical advisor. And it's not, uh, it, most of the time, if you dig deep enough, you will see that the reason for this might be a very simple one, might be the fact that the legal language is not present in the country. There's no term to, there is no way I could hire a counselor as a counselor because the labor law doesn't recognize that occupation or profession. Therefore, based on the future roles of this future employee, I need to find another box, another label. So this is mostly um, this um, legal language or the lack of thereof. Uh, is usually the main reason why we see all this diversity in the in the terms and titles. Uh, this is interesting too for us to watch, sit back and watch. Two, 20 years ago or so, uh, when we talked about counseling, uh, the public would immediately jump and tell you, well, yes, counseling, whatever they could understand or whatever their understanding was, was performed by, or services, counseling services were performed by psychologists, educational specialists, career specialists, right? And uh, now we can see how psychologists went to the bottom of this list uh, because they start little by little not to be always associated to the activities of counseling. They, it, we see this very slow, very slow process in which the counseling services are more in the in a public conscience are assigned to experts they're not necessary psychologists they might have psychology background but they're not identified they don't have the professional title of, the, of a psychologist or psychotherapist and i believe this is good this is the first sign that the profession um might happen to be created and it, it gets its own identity. And it actually uh, has a more and more certain appearance in the eyes of the public. Um, 
we talked a little bit about the challenges um just a review national certifications uh or this is just uh i think i just <laughs> duplicated this slide sorry um but another thing that i mentioned and this very very important we talked about the various universities in in romania or or in europe that offer counseling programs um the emphasis is now on content we we learn we're at the level where we don't have the information the skill part is so and so we have very very few counselor educators that are thoroughly trained and uh, they're able to 100% train their students in skills. They learn, but we're still in the beginning. And that impacts the supervision-like activities. They're almost non-existent. We're not in Europe, and let's talk about Romania, we're not at the point where we even question what will happen with this graduate what will happen with this person that we trained that will go in some school or in some institution and they will they will need help we don't even think that way yet or at least not not all of us uh, again we talked about status roles and responsibilities and when we in talking about it i want you to imagine this continuum or this it's a spectrum you will see countries, and this is not limited to Europe. You can see the same situation in Asia as well, for that matter. Um, you can see countries and institutions where counseling is just a role. You know, you might be a human resource, uh, resources expert. You might be uh, an educator in, in various areas, but once in a while or maybe on daily basis you perform a counseling like role and this is the the way we found out about it is because let's say in romania when we founded a professional association we got requests from people that we we have we never thought about as counselors but they learning about counseling they identified themselves as counselors so we have that situation and then the aim the goal is to get to the point where counseling becomes a separate helping profession and with all that involves with with the autonomous um regulations with a set of standards with uh, supervision, clinical supervision, and administrative supervision for that matter, that comes from uh, the same profession and not from different professions, and so on and so forth. Um, so thank you, Gideon, for the <laughs> heads up. So um, we talked about the contextual type of, of the status of the role of the counselor and i'll give you a very quick example in romania according to the law if you um if you are a graduate from psychology sociology science of education uh, then you can go in any school in romania and uh, get a school counselor position so that's the law now on your university diploma, it says educator or psychologist or sociologist, but you go to that school and you get the occupation of a counselor. Now you work there for 10 years, let's say, and you do great stuff and you build programs and you help kids and communities. Then you lose your job or you decide to leave that job. When people ask you, what are you? You cannot say you are a counselor you have to say that you are an educator or a psychologist because counseling is not a profession and is nowhere recognized so that's why i'm talking about uh the contextual type of of this type of of identity um these are um 
you know, these are other challenges. We need to get uh, more power towards the professional associations and we need to network more and befriend more other helping professions and learn from each other. We need to address the, com the confusing and amb ambiguous laws. And all in all, we need more leadership. Uh, the political and administrative aspect that I mentioned about, we talked about the European Union and um, we talked about their uh, goal, the European Union's goal to build this uh, centralized reality in standards, which is a great role. Um, the problem is that every single country is at a different level. Then we have the Bologna system in, in education in Europe. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. Uh, this, is, uh, this impacts a lot the accreditation system. In other words, if I want to build a counseling program and I want to copy for, for legitimate reasons, I want to, let's say, not copy, but in, implement some ideas that I learned about in the US master's level program. I might not be able to because in the Bologna system, I, there, is n there are no ways to justify sometimes why I need that amount of internship or supervision or any type of practical activities. They're, they're going out of their standard that is supposed to fit all. So that's, that's an academic type of, of a barrier that Europe is trying to address when building counseling programs. And uh, then we have to deal with the cultural background of every country. And this is for you, just an image of, I put together here all the, the, the fight to move the counseling from a role to a separate helping profession. And we talked about professional identity, th that professional identity that is a contextual and is stronger in schools and vocational settings. Um, then at the political level, we talked about the EU political situation uh, that actually impacts the relationship with other professional, uh, helping professionals. Uh, the contextual factors in Europe, cultural and administrative, and then you know, the elements that we're all familiar with, body of knowledge, regulation, and continuing education that have to be addressed with all these elements, the accreditation, the evaluation, credentialing, supervision, and code of ethics. So this is for many of us in Europe, this is our mantra. This is what we have on the wall in our offices. This is what we aspire to. And that's where we need your help. So we also, Europe needs a mentality shift. And some countries are, are um, a lot closer to that because of many factors, cultural and, and political, Europeans still have a reactive attitude towards education and, and uh, standards. They accept, they wait for everything to come from the state or from some authority. And sometimes they're so passive that they just don't do anything for their life and career, they're not to be blamed. This is how education has been. This is how, this is the type of ideas they've been confronted with. And it, until very recently, having a proactive attitude could get you in trouble. You know, in terms of uh, you might have lost your job or uh, your kids in school might have problems. Uh, so this is a mentality shift that we see, me and my colleagues see happening faster in newer generations. So newer generations are more entrepreneurial. They're very, very proactive uh, and they create their own reality and therefore they create the future. Uh, also, we talk about the, let's talk about the diploma. So you understand the diploma versus certification system in Europe, which is a very old, think about the first European universities in the Middle Ages. For many, many, many years, your education at the uh, uh, academic level ended up with a diploma that was good for the rest of your life. That is still going on here. It's fine. But for many, many years, the certification or the licensure system was not well spread. So now 
uh, people need to be aware that yes, they might pay for an education program, they might pay for a certification program that might be good or elite or um, available for them for three years or five years. They need to make efforts to support that with continuing education and keeping the skills alive. So this is another mentality shift that is happening in Europe and it's too, it's helpful for us, the, the people that are trying to train counselors. In Romania's case, few elements about the culture. One thing I would like to tell you, so you, you are better equipped in understanding um, in understanding, and yes, I'll keep, I'll keep, I will ask for your permission to stay five minutes more. Do you think it's possible? Not if it's possible. Christina? Um, okay, so thank you. Um, one thing that you need to be aware of when you, you talk to a Romanian, uh, and this is about the tradition. We're part of the Orthodox Church. And we've been for, for thousands of years, right? What, what the American call Greek Orthodox Church. And we have mysteries. We talk about mysteries as individual experience. And, uh, and when we talk about Christianing, confession, marriage, or death, we talk about these things with our priest. We don't go and talk to a stranger. It's actually, it's a no-no thing to talk to a stranger outside of your family uh, and as a woman, you never talk about those things with a man unless he's your husband or your, no, I mean your father, but that never happens. So uh, keep that in mind and now try to think about what you consider to be the best counseling experience and interaction. They, those realities don't really fit. And it, it takes a generational effort, one generation, two generations, for Romanians to go to be at the point where they don't feel ashamed, they don't feel that um, have to deal with any type of, type of stigma, and they feel fulfilled and they're able to accept help, help by talking to a counselor. Um, we talked a little bit about the um, uh, political context, the challenges are the same, um, in my personal experience, when I started to do supervision back in 2002, I was in a very interesting situation because I was the sole counselor educator. So I was their teacher. I was some of the students' friend and I was their supervisor. And that had a great impact on myself. Um, in terms of trying to strengthen my boundaries. And it did, I mean, it was what you would call a, an ethical disaster, you know, but we were just a, a handful of us and we had to find a way to go ahead. Uh, the achievements in my country, I would name the Romanian Counselors Association. We have the first, uh, the Romanian Counselor Association also created, uh, founded the first journal in counseling in Europe. Uh, and when I say the first journal in counseling, there are many journals in counseling in Europe, but they're counseling and psychotherapy or their education in counseling. This is pure counseling. Uh, we have some vocational type certifications for occupation with very interesting standards. We had we have master counselings, um, master's level counselling programs. We have more and more doctoral level research in counselling. We had Fulbright counselling scholars in Europe, in, in Romania, and we have introduced elements of supervision, supervision, supervision in, in several programs. So my last words, uh, I want to turn this table to you, this discussion, and I want, I would love if you would consider this, our first interaction, not being the last. And, and you would consider this just there in the back of your mind, an opportunity to grow for yourself and for your colleagues outside of the country. Uh, and the way I see it and the way I was educated I, and I have um, developed um, I think 
uh, and you must be you might be aware already that you are privileged to study counseling here you have books you have articles you have classes and you have very experienced instructors uh, regulations you know what to do not to fail you know what the rules are which is amazing for someone like me um, I also met uh, some some misconceptions about the American uh, uh, among American based uh, students uh, they were surprised that not the rest of the world understood counseling the way we understand it in the United States or um, they were surprised that their US based credential was not recognized and nobody was actually interested in it uh, outside of the US. Uh, then this is a matter of a different discussion. Ask yourself, what is in fact an international student in the, U in the US? Is this just a foreign student? Are our universities here in the US accommodating that student in any way recognizing that or maybe that's not possible yet because of cake rep regulations and so on and so forth. So the conclusions and for you are, this is a personal advice that I give to my students in Romania and Europe. While climbing the trees, contemplate the forest, I'm personally aware of your struggles and fight, and it's the good fight, to stay afloat, to develop, to get a name in this profession. I know about all the research that you have to do, about the competition, about the, lack, the sleep deprivation. And it's a normal stage, it's, it's normal. All of us, when young, we do that, or less young in my case. But don't, don't forget about the profession as a whole. I met wonderful, wonderful students. They're so passionate about skills, about this and that. And, and they were so amazed to learn about the reality of the entire profession. Where are they? What they can, you know, what they can create in order to have impact on the entire profession. So that's what I call the forest. Network. Network among us. Network with the international students. Uh, reach out. Go on Google and look for universities around the world that offer counseling programs. And ask how can you help if you want to help mentor mentor your international students colleagues mentor them and offer support uh, and i hope that this webinar and, and especially the webinars before that i was very um intimidated with will be able to be offered uh for free to international communities as well so um thank you again for your amazing patience with my technical problems. And please don't hesitate to send me suggestions in the first place and ideas. That's how we made it, we made it there with support from people like you. So thank you. And now let's hear the questions. Gideon, I think you are. Amazing. Thank you, thank you Dr. Slavi. Amazing work. Um, yeah, let's open the floor here. Um, what are some uh, questions, reflections, comments, pieces that you have for Dr. Sislagi here? Hmm. Uh, Dr. Sislagi, can you hear me? Yes, and you can call me Andrea, it's easier. Andrea, well, thank you so much. Um, I had a couple questions real quick. Um, so when you were just exploring this whole counseling profession and really basically doing it on your own with no help, did you, where did you find all your source material? Was it, was it English based and you had to kind of interpret it in Romanian and, or how did that whole process, that sounds so, uh, such a huge process, such a difficult process. And then it sounds like you didn't have any source material there. So you had to go outside the country in a whole nother language. And that just process just sounds so intimidating to me. But just, it just, I mean, it feels, it's just, uh, it sounds like it's such a courageous thing that you did, but then also the difficulties that you must have faced in just the language interpretation of things as well. Yes, uh, that's actually a very good question. And uh, not everybody's aware that you might be bilingual or you might learn. But my English is obviously, <laughs> uh, English is a second language, right? You can, you can tell that. Uh, and it was by far not that good then, 
and especially with the uh, the professional vocabulary i struggled i didn't know what those terms mm -hmm. were. but to answer your question um two years in my doctoral program while i was trying to do uh the practical part um i realized that the literature i had available that came mostly from psychotherapy in romania that was not congruent with with what my goal was so uh that's when my chair the old gentleman the professor who said i don't know anything that's when he put me in touch with the honorary president of the international association of counseling for mm -hmm. counseling hans hoxter dr hans hoxter one of my first mentors and he sent me two issues of the BACP, British Association for Counseling and Psychotherapy uh, journal. And they were very thin. And it took me a month to translate, not only translate, but to understand. I remember how many times I Xerox copied the pages and every single time I would look at the clean page, I would see something else and understand something else. Um, this was, I don't, uh, you say courageous. Uh, that's, I take it as a compliment. Um, I think I was a little bit desperate at that time. <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, so I already, I'm two years into this effort and I just don't know what I'm doing. So next thing, I talked to Hans Hoxter and he sponsored, I was unable to pay for foreign uh, trips or conferences. Uh, and he sponsored uh, my participation to an internet, to an annual conference of International Association for Counseling. And that's when I met American based um, and British based, uh, UK based um, and Canadian based counselor educators. And what I did, um, Honestly, I begged. I said, please send me any book you can think of. It's okay. And they were like, yeah, we have all the editions in there. And I was like, doesn't matter. Just send everything you have. And there is one practitioner uh, in the United States I remember clearly because she sent me a box of books and there was the first box with counseling books that arrived to America, to, to Romania from, from the US. And her name is, uh, she's Dr. Forrester Miller. I don't know if you are familiar with her work. So to her, I mean, I, I, I will always think about her. She saved me in a sense. And then while I was translating and reading, I realized that I gained more and more speed and understanding, then the other boxes started to come. Mm. And so it was a huge support and from people coming from the organizations that I, I listed in the beginning. And uh, yes, and somehow I became an expert in the English type of literature and counseling. I also got a literature from France. France is heavily oriented towards vocational guidance and also from the um, Canadian uh, Career Counseling Association from their president at the time, Dr. Norman Amundsen. So he sent me books. Uh, Richard Bowles, you know, What Color Is Your Parachute, sent me 30 copies of that year book. I mean, people that I, I never expected this type of support. And I was also told that, oh, We've never heard about someone like you, so that's an interesting experiment for us. Yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, thank you. I have one other question, but I'll let someone else ask, and then if, if no one else asks, I'll ask my other question. Sure. Yeah, maybe, let, maybe let's take uh, just uh, one or two more questions before we move to a close here. Um, I want to, you know, in one part, respect your respect, respect everyone's time boundary, but I also realize, I mean, this, this conversation is great. I think that I think that like dedication and passion that you have you. really just shines through, and this is yeah, it's tangible. Um, any other pieces out there? Any other questions, reflections people have? Uh, Christina, I cannot hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Um. I have so many thoughts and so many comments that I want to make. I, I actually come from a very strong career development background and then moved into school and, and um, 
I think for me, when I first found out that you came from the career development or our vocational sphere, I was so concerned that um, I was going to hear what I usually hear um, was the terminology using, being used incorrectly. And I want to thank you so much because I didn't know what I was going to do if you did, didn't use occupation or vocation or if you were, you know, throwing career out all over the place. And so you really released my energy in that. Um, I, I mean, I'm really, I'm really intrigued by, especially when you mentioned, you know, that you, there was this challenge of individuals who were always told what they were going to do. And then they were now in this space, which well, we would call freedom of choice, which probably was a nightmare for this population. Um, of, you know, it's almost like cognitive dissonance is like, what is this crappy word of freedom of choice? Um, and they didn't have those skills and they suddenly did have to be a little bit more introspective and had the option to determine where they wanted to be. Um, and I never thought of that. And I mean, considering that you didn't completely have all that counseling background, what do you what would you say were the biggest challenges that you had to address with that population? And especially since you had no dictionary of occupational titles or even yeah. them even having the ability to have ever thought, who am I? Yes. Uh, well, that's a very good question and I try not to give you the most complex answer, uh, but that's a very good point. Yes, I come from a culture where when I turned, when I graduated high school and I turned 18, basically, I was still fulfilling my parents' wishes when it came to my career. My parents decided that at 14, I would go to a high school that certified um, kindergarten and primary school teachers. And they decided that when I would turn 18, I will stay in this little city, the small city where I grew up, and I'll be a primary school teacher because that was an honorable profession for a woman. My father wanted to also to marry me in no time. So that's where I came from. And then I decided to go to Bucharest, which is a capital city. And I decided to, to um, access one of those very new, you know, specializations without having any idea what they uh, involved. But uh, I learned, I studied in high school psychology and, and, uh, and teaching, and um, I felt like I had an idea. And I am one of the, let's say, uh, lucky cases, because even now, after so many, we can talk about one or two generations that have happened in, the, in, in between, right? We're talking about 1990 versus 2018, 2019. Even now, you see the most of the kids in, in colleges that have no idea what they, they're doing there. And they try to fulfill their mom's wishes or their father's wishes. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting experience for them, personal experience, to realize that Yes, between what you said, Christine, this, this uh, freedom of choice that they are exposed to, like it's, it's, a, it's a value that is kind of floating around everywhere in Europe. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. And then is the pressure from the family and from the tradition. And they just, they don't know where to go. So to answer your question, I, because I worked, I, I graduated college in 1995 and the same year I started to work for the Polytechnic University in Bucharest. And I dealt with engineers and some, probably five or 10% of them were really happy and passionate about what they're doing. The others had very uh, many, many reasons to be there and they're not, in our terms, they're not the right ones. So what we did, no we were not aware that we're doing counseling or trying to do counseling. counseling. What I did, I went back to personal advice. And in terms of never making a decision, and it's interesting that I did it intuitively, not that I read in a book and I knew that it's wrong to make decisions for other people, 
but I did it intuitively and um, I just talked to them and I asked questions. And many cases that I had ended up by dropping, dropping school, going and getting a job, uh, or changing the spe specialization, or you know, various directions. Uh, and I think we were successful, you know, with that community in the beginning and the the ones that followed. We're still in touch. We uh, informally track uh, and follow, you know, their advancement. So that's what we're doing. Thank you. You're welcome. Amazing. Well, I will. I'll just offer um, some some closing remarks here, and then we can we can move to a close. I just want to say, you know, a deep deep gratitude to you, Andrea, to just jumping in here uh, and and offering up your dedication, your passion, um, and also giving us a call to action, and not just not just sharing your story, but also charging us to continue the good work that you're doing and, and build on. Really, right, the shoulders of giants. Um, this has been amazing. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be sure just to make mention here, uh, expect a follow-up survey in the coming days um, to kind of you know, capture what this experience has been like for you. Um, and I'll be sure to include in there um, contact information in case you, 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 you do have more questions, right? Uh, yes. going forward. Um, I think what, that's one of the amazing pieces about this is that you know, you know, making, making leaders, making scholars accessible, um, I think it helps break down those barriers. So. Um, thank you all for gathering today, and Dr. Sazagi, um, any other closing remarks you have for us before we scoot out? Uh, yes, always. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't worry about that. Uh, in short, we, all of us here in this space, uh, there is no way we will escape this reality of a global, global village. We are in a global village, counseling included. So, I believe that I, uh, we need you. You know, me, myself, and my colleagues and my students will always need people like you. You've been exposed to so many um, influences here. You know so much. Uh, so I would say let's take advantage of the uh, technology that we all have available and stay in touch if you feel like. If you have questions, I would be always willing to talk to you by Zoom or by email. And again, reach out to your colleagues outside of the United States. Yeah, amazing. Thank you all, thank you all. Have a great rest of your weekend and I look forward to seeing you at future CRL webinars. Take care, have a good one. Thank you. Thank you.